The New Testament passage for today and also our passage for exegete is found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, and into chapter 2, verse 3. Colossians chapter 29, into chapter 2, verse 3. The title for today's passage is Some Are Called to Suffer, Part 2, picking up from the previous sermon. Colossians chapter 1, verse 29 through chapter 2, verse 3. Some are called to suffer, part 2. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you now and we ask that you illumine your word to your saints. We beg of you to enable us to worship in spirit and truth as you have called us to come. Only you can do this, Father. Be with us now. Our cup is empty. Fill it till it overfloweth. In the name of and for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul continues here to identify his life as one of suffering for the sake of the church. He had been doing this in the last one, having just described himself in general terms as suffering for Christ's sake in the New Covenant era in verse 24. Paul now gets real specific and points out his suffering for the church at Colossae and nearby Laodicea in chapter 2. So he says in the last sermon I had done, and uh, some are called to suffer part 1, he, he basically says, and that's me, I'm suffering. And we laid out how in Acts, Christ had called him and said, I'm going to show him how to suffer for my name's sake. I'm calling him for this purpose. And he reiterated that and said, I am suffering in this new covenant era. He now is going to lay out, I'm suffering for you, for your church and a nearby church in Laodicea. It's very personal to you guys. It's not just generally speaking Therefore, listen to what I'm saying. I'm talking to you. Boy, if I was receiving that letter, you'd have my attention at that point, wouldn't you? I mean, if he was speaking in generalities, yeah, I would be listening. But then if he said, and Seth, I'd say, whoa, 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 okay. If he said, and I'm speaking to Faith Community Church, I'd say, whoa, whoa, stop, what? You have my attention now. That's what he's doing here. Let's look at verse 29 of chapter 1. He says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. Now see, this verse bridges the first message I had done, with this week's message. It belongs to both. It's one of those bridging verses that you pack on to the tail end of one and you pack on to the beginning of another because it belongs to both. It belongs to both. It ties off that message noting that Paul's struggles were meant to help them grow into maturity. Right? That's how we had finished that sermon. But it propels this week's message by noting that it is by and through his energy, that being Christ Jesus, that all of Paul's works are being achieved. It's in and through Christ that it's all happening. Paul isn't just some smart guy making this happen. Pastors today are not just making it happen through cute messages. It's through the power of Jesus Christ and preaching Christ crucified that the church grows, period. Amen. If the church is growing by any other means, hmm, who's growing it? I don't want to know. Don't put me on those rolls, right? If a church is not preaching Christ crucified and the church is exploding and people are coming from all over the place 
and they're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, what gospel are they preaching? They're preaching one that many people want to hear. We'll get into that in just a few moments. But again, verse 29 being one of those bridging verses here, he had ended that one by saying, you have to understand that being a Christian, you grow all along the way into being a mature Christian. You don't stay drinking the milk your whole life. You got to grow. Okay? If, if I see you five years from now and you still have a sippy cup, we have a problem. Right? We got, we got to grow. And that's basically what he says. And he says it throughout many of his letters. We've got to grow. We have things to do. But now he's saying that growth as he moves forward, has to be right growth. Now, again, I see my friend over here who's a big gorilla. Okay? He works out and he puts things on Facebook where he's lifting like 16,000 pounds. Okay? I'm not going to point him out. Okay? But I watch these YouTube videos about how to try and be like him. And... So I'm trying to like lift weights like him and, and try and you know look in the mirror. Right? And I'm getting there. Just ask me, right? So, but I, I say this because it's very important I'm learning that when you're losing weight, for example, you can become known as something known as skinny fat. I had never heard this term before. I said, what? That's horrifying. What? Where you just lost 20 pounds of muscle. No. <laughs> right? No. So uh, I lost a bunch of weight, but I lost all the weight I didn't want to lose. I lost the, the muscle, right? So that's, that's a horrifying thought. So uh, why am I saying this? Because he's saying here, not only do you have to be mature, but the energy that you're using to grow in needs to be the right energy producing the right kind of growth. So the energy needs to be of Christ growing in the right way. Otherwise, you're going to get skinny fat. Okay, you're going to use the wrong energy producing the wrong kind of thing. You get it? Okay. So you'll, you'll look like you're skinny. You'll fit in the right kind of clothes. But then you go to run to the car on your knee buckles and you hit your head on the bumper. Because your muscles are gone. You're skinny back. At least that's what I think would happen. I know. I, I'm scared of these things. It's horrifying. I have a very active imagination. <laughs> so we want to draw from the power of Christ in our growth, in our maturing, but also in a different way. He says, draw from the power of Christ in your seeing and in your hearing. This becomes very important. Because don't forget what the letter is being written for. There are wolves among you. Oh, my God. Oh. Oh. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Let me just cover a little background here. This verse reinforces again that Paul did not plant this particular church, but in fact, it was planted by one of Paul's pupils, that being a path that he mentioned earlier in chapter 1. Hence the reason Paul feels so compelled 
to reach out and repair issues within this church personally. One of his pupils planted this church. So there's a problem within this church. So he feels personally he needs to reach out and try and fix some issues within it. You can understand that, right? He wants to make sure it is being done right. But now look at or verse 2. He starts to identify some of these things here. Verse 2, he says, That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Here's where Paul, once more, goes directly at the false teachers and teachings that have been entering the church through the back door, through whispers and shadows, have ended up in the church somehow. These teachers and these teachings have taught that there were hidden teachings and hidden treasures found within those hidden teachings. They taught that there was a secret knowledge that was to be sought after and that one could actually attain it with their help, of course. All you needed, guys, all you needed was Jesus and them. Well, what did I tell you about that a long time ago? If it's Jesus and, it's garbage. It's Jesus, period. Right? If anybody comes and says it's Jesus and Joseph Smith, it's garbage. It's Jesus and you, garbage. It's Jesus, period. It's not Jesus goes 99% of the way and you go 1% of the way. I need a God that goes 100% of the way, right? I don't need a God that falls short. I need a God that, that conquers me, right? Not almost does it. It's Jesus, period. But these teachers were sneaking in the door. And they were saying, no, 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 we're not saying it's not Jesus. No, 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 no. It's Jesus. But there's some secret teachings too. Shh. Let me tell you some secrets. What do you think that would do to a church? Well, what do you think that would do to a church if I told you guys some secret teachings and didn't tell them? Oh, boy, that just breeds unity, doesn't it? Kumbaya, right? No, no. That is horrifying. That obviously cannot be of God, can it? A house divided against itself, huh? Yeah, that's a strong one. Paul says something contrary to them in this verse. Paul notes right from the beginning, you guys are to be knit together in love, not divided through secret handshakes. You're to be knit together in love. Knit together means tied together. You love each other. If I love you, I don't have a secret that I don't share with you. If I love you, if I have a teaching that draws me closer to Jesus Christ, why would I withhold that from you if I love you? Think about that for a minute. Why would I withhold that from you? If I withhold it from you, doesn't that make me in some kind of proud position over you? That's what it would breed me, would it? Does that sound like something God would want in his church? No. So why would that teaching be of the Lord? It's not. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul's saying whatever they're trying to teach you, it's not of the Lord. Be knit together in love, not division, not one over each other. He says, stop that. Knock it off. And he continues. He says, have the full assurance. The word assurance is a very specific word in the scripture. Assurance means assurance of your salvation. Assurance of salvation only comes one way. 
Let me tell you first how it doesn't come. Assurance of salvation does not come just by prayer. Assurance of salvation does not come just by showing up to Bible studies. Assurance of salvation does not come just by identifying yourself as a Christian. Assurance of salvation comes by word and sacrament alone. Well, where do you get that? At church on Sunday. By the delivering of the gospel and the delivering of the sacrament, we are fed spiritually and assured of our salvation. That's how we are assured. That's why we do it. It's not snack time. It's to be spiritually assured that we are saved. Why? Because when we walk out those doors, everything out there tells us we're not. Everything out there wants to tell us there's something better. And we need something to counteract that, don't we? We need something strong. But what's stronger than the Word of God? What's stronger than Christ preached and Christ given? Nothing. Nothing can hold a candle to that. That's how we get assurance. And that's why he's saying you have all the tools that you need. There's nothing hidden behind the pulpit here that you need. It's right here. You don't need any more. Sometimes that's hard for us to understand. Sometimes we, we can't quite accept the simplicity of the cross. Sometimes we think, no, there's got to be more to it. Am I alone in that? Did you, did you ever think that sometimes, like, or at least early in your Christianity, did you think, well, it's, there's got to be more. What, what, there, there has to be, I have to do something, not just simply have faith in this. There's got to be, I got to have faith and I got to do like 12 other things, right? What, that's why false teachings so easily take hold in early Christians. Because we think that we have to earn something. Why? Because we make each other earn stuff. And therefore, we think our relationship with God is the same way. So when God says, no, I earned it for you, we go, no, what? I don't know how to accept that. that the equivalent of that is a billionaire coming to you and saying, hey, I earned a billion dollars for you. Here you go. Have a good day. And you're saying, well, what do I have to do? Nothing. Spend it. We wouldn't know how to accept that, would we? We would be suspect of it, huh? We'd be like, are you sure? Are you a drug dealer? What's going on here? Am I going to get arrested? I'm not sure. I'd buy like a piece of candy. Is this, is this real? <laughs> so we're, we're suspect that way. We're suspect of God in the same way. We have a hard time receiving such a bounty, such a treasure Free. Wow. That's why false teachers can creep in and go, it's not free. <laughs> but then he says something else here. He says, not only in verse two here, he says, I want their hearts to be encouraged, being knit together in love. I want them to reach all the riches of full, full assurance of understanding and of the knowledge of God's mystery. The knowledge of God's mystery. Well, the real knowledge and the real understanding of what is known and knowable is what he's talking about here. If you have your Bibles open, I would like you to turn to Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. And the reason why is because if you write in your Bibles, this is one that you should circle, put stars next to, highlight, flag it on the side, 
and then maybe put like a firecracker out the side or something because you should never forget this verse Deuteronomy 29 29 it's kind of easy to remember too 29 29 29 29 Deuteronomy 29 so the first five books of the Bible it's in the first five books of the Bible Deuteronomy 29 29 the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. If somebody comes to you and says, I have secret knowledge about God, turn around and walk away. Because it ain't something that you need to know. Right. Just say Deuteronomy 29, 29. Yep. I mean, there's direct, there's direct scripture, guys. I mean, you don't have to, it's not, it's not a guess anymore. It's not even wisdom. It is wisdom, but you don't even have to rely on wisdom. You just rely directly on the word of God. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The hidden things don't belong to me. But the revealed things belong to me. The revealed word of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I have that. And it is fully sufficient. Amen. It fills me up. It overflows my cup. What more do I need? Why are you promising me something more? What, 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 what is there that's more? How can you overflow my cup even more? I don't understand it. Now he continues here. He says, uh, Rich is a full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, comma. He then reveals what God's mystery is, which is Christ. Now what does he mean by this mystery, which is Christ? Well, think about in the Old Testament. The mystery was how was God going to redeem mankind? They knew that it was going to be a Messiah, but who, when, where, how? Well, and so throughout the Old Testament, little nuggets were dropped. But then by the time Christ comes, you have, you have this conundrum. How is he going to come from Egypt but be a Nazarite and be from Bethlehem? That don't make a lick of sense until the birth narratives of Jesus happen. Then you go, oh, that's how God's going to do it. But prior to that happening, can you understand how that would be a mystery? I would look at that and it almost, I'm, I'm going to say something that might scare you. I would look at that and think, Something's wrong here. Can I trust this? I would have to have faith. God, I'm, I'm faithing in your word because it, it, it doesn't make sense to me here. I would have to have great faith and trust in God's word. It's no different in today's day and age. When I look at New Testament texts that I struggle with, I got to have the same faith, don't I? Father, I don't, I don't know what to do with this particular text, but I am faithing that it's right and it's true. I trust you, and this is your word. No different, right? So the knowledge of God's mystery is that of Christ. Look in verse 3. <clears throat> A lot in just these three verses, huh? Yeah, God's word is just dripping with goodness. He says, which is, it, which is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ alone, he says, are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So what in the heck are these false teachers offering you then? They're offering you, are you ready for it? Something outside of Christ. Run! Amen. <laughs> Run! 
I mean, it's that simple. I mean, I'm surprised that wasn't the next word here. He says, if all the things are found in Christ, if all the wisdom, all the knowledge that you need for salvation and salvific living, if all of it is found in Christ, and somebody says, psst, I got some more, then whatever they're whispering is found outside of Jesus. I don't want that. Amen. That's garbage. Run. Run. Friends, next week in particular, we start to we start to dive in. I know you thought we already did. We start to dive in. Paul rips the curtain down and says, okay, the false teachers start really doing this and he starts diving in and, and he, he's no longer doing it in generalities. Okay, he basically starts naming names without naming names. Okay, there's, no, there's no longer wondering who he's talking about <laughs> so, uh, at this point. And he really starts to give specifics, and he starts to doctrinally pick it apart. Instead of just saying, don't listen to them, it starts to become, don't listen to them because of this. And gives us tools and answers, which is what we need, Right? But I want you to know something. As we go into the next few months of this, because Colossians, again, is saturated with Jesus as our King, as our Lord, as our, as our guide through life. This world has a different gospel it's preaching. And it presents it Loud and proud every day to us and to our children and to our grandchildren. It has its own disciples and its own missionaries. Its own disciples and its own missionaries that are sent out into our churches. Because we're the mission field for them. Yeah. Constantly trying to convert us to their religion. They often look and sound and dress and talk and reason just as we do. And so they fit in quite well. But soon enough, friends, often through home Bible studies, small groups. Oftentimes they led because, well, they wanted to help. Soon enough, you begin to see the sheep costume begin to loosen and the wolf slobber begin to build up. And it becomes clear by the fruit of what they're teaching, who and what they are. You shall know them by their fruits, we're told. As your pastor, I have one sentence that I'd like to tell you. Be on guard, dear brothers and sisters, You are always being hunted. That's right. That's right. Sometimes we're lulled into thinking that we're not. Every billboard out there wants you. Yep. Every commercial, every radio station, Amen. every show, every person at the grocery store line, every tabloid, every person that doesn't go to church that's a friend or a family member, that's all right. of them want you. They want you for themselves. Jesus Christ said, if they persecuted me, 
what do you think they're going to do to you? But Jesus Christ stands with us, and we're not alone. The war is won, and these are simple little skirmishes. The power of Christ is the way in which we walk. The power that we pull from is what Paul said. He said, pull from the strength of Jesus Christ, not your flesh. You have that strength to pull from. Just know that that's going on around you. Don't close your eyes to it. Open your eyes. See it. Know that it's there. Know what's going on. Stand proud. Link arms with your brothers and sisters and say, bring it. I stand with Jesus Christ. That's right. You're not going to hurt Linda. You're not going to hurt Wendy. You're not going to hurt Chuck. You're not going to hurt any of these people. And they're not, you're not going to hurt me. Why? Because we are a family. That's right. When that one falls, I lift him up. When I fall, they lift me up. That's what this looks like. None of us are perfect. But all of us are going home. Join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We are so thankful that you not only gave your only begotten Son for our salvation, but then you gave us the church. This world tried to take the church from us. It was COVID yesterday. It'll be something else tomorrow. Father, protect us. Guard your children, we beg of you. First and foremost, guard the worthiness of the church in the mind and the heart of the church people. Remind them of why this is necessary. Father, sometimes people stop going to church for months and they forget the power of the people gathered, the safety in numbers, the goodness in the gathering. Remind us all, Father. Remind each and every one of us here to reach out throughout the week to numerous people to say, I love you, I'm thinking about you. Can I bear your burdens this day? No one of us can reach out to everybody. But why can't we reach out to one? Five. We can. Let's strengthen the bonds, Father, between each and every one of us here. Let's be a solid rock, Father. When the world crashes up against us, let the world break. Be with us, Father. In the name of and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.